It's December 18, 1978. Ernie Cobb sits on the couch in his living room and drapes one of his long, muscular arms around his girlfriend. She says something, but he doesn't quite hear it because at the moment, Cobb's brown eyes are fixed on the TV screen in front of them. A news reporter is standing at JFK Airport in New York City. It was here just last week that a spectacular robbery took place. Masked gunmen stormed the cargo building for Lufthansa Airlines, and they made off with a massive amount of unmarked cash. Today, the news reporter has the latest update. It appears the thieves stole a total of $5 million. Cobb lets out a low whistle. Five million. Cobb's an unpaid basketball player for the Boston College Eagles. He can hardly imagine money that big. Cobb shifts his arm. He can tell that his girlfriend, Laverne Mosley, isn't paying attention to the newscaster. But it seems that she's also thinking about money. Her eyes are locked on a thick envelope that's resting on the coffee table. The envelope and its contents are from Rocco Perla. Cobb only met Perla once, and that was eight days ago, when he came to Cobb's apartment. After the two spent some time talking basketball, Perla brought up another subject, gambling, and changing the final scores of the Eagles games through point shaving. The two hadn't seen each other since, but two days ago, Perla reappeared. He approached Cobb's girlfriend, Laverne, after the Eagles barely squeaked out a win against Harvard. Perla handed her an envelope and said it was something for Cobb. When Cobb finally opened it, his jaw dropped. Inside was $1,000 in cash. Cobb looks over at Mosley and sees she's glaring at him. He leans forward and turns off the TV. Laverne, do I have to say it again? This money isn't dirty, okay? When that man came here with Rick Kuhn, you said he asked you to cheat. Now he hands me an envelope full of bills and says, give this to Ernie for a job well done. What am I supposed to think? Honey, I told you what I said to him last night. I don't miss shots. When the ball is in my hands, the next stop is the net every time. Then what did you do to earn this kind of cash? I didn't do anything. I just had to bet big on the Harvard game and we won. I guess they're showing me some appreciation or something. No, there's something else going on. Are you cheating the games? Be honest with me. Cobb frowns and leans back. I am being honest and I don't want to argue. Plus, it's not that much money. You want to talk about cheating? Look at those boys on the TV. They took $5 million. Ernie, I don't care if it's $20. You need to give that money back. Rick and his friends, they're criminals. No, no, they're not. Rick's on my team. Mosley fixes him with a stare. Ernie, none of those people are on your team. Mosley then stands and walks out of the room. Cobb shakes his head. He doesn't understand the problem. They needed money. Now they have some. What's wrong with that? Cobb turns the TV back on. And on the screen, a New York City police captain is addressing reporters. He issues a stern warning. Police are coming for all the thieves who stole from Lufthansa. No one is going to get away with this. And soon, these criminals will be in custody. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In the late 1970s, New York's mafia hatched a potentially lucrative plan placing bets on Boston College basketball games. But to make sure their bets would pay off, the Mafia needed help from the basketball players themselves. Boston College players would have to manipulate the outcomes of games, and in return, the Mafia would give some of their winnings to the players. But the scheme got off to a rocky start, as players were reluctant to get in line. Then, as the season rolled along and money kept pouring in, there were more surprises. This is Episode 2, You Can Bet Your Life. It's December 20th, 1978, in Queens, New York City. Henry Hill sits at a bar inside the dimly lit Roberts Lounge, wearing a silk suit and nursing his third scotch and soda. Hill has plenty to celebrate. His drug-running business is making huge profits. Just last week, he and Paul Maisie moved another $10,000 worth of cocaine and heroin. And that's not their only moneymaker. Hill also has the fix at Boston College. 
Finally, those kids got their act together and it's paying off. Because right now, Hill has thousands of dollars in his pocket thanks to the Boston College Eagles' poor performance against Harvard in their recent basketball game. And that's not even the end of it. Hill learned that his friend and mentor, the mobster Jimmy Burke, just pulled off the greatest cash heist in American history. Burke's crew robbed Lufthansa, the German airline, and made off with over five million in cash. So yes, it should be time to celebrate. And yet, Hill feels anything but festive. He takes a sip from his drink and looks down at the end of the bar. That's where Jimmy Burke is sitting and chain-smoking. The Lufthansa robbery itself did go off without a hitch, but it was after the heist that the problems started. A man known as Stax Edwards was supposed to drive the getaway van to a junkyard. There, the van would be crushed, along with any evidence inside. But Edwards never made it to the junkyard. The man, one of Hill's friends, instead got high and drove the van to his girlfriend's place, parking it in front of a fire hydrant. Early the next morning, police discovered it and identified the vehicle. Even worse, they dug around the van and found ski masks and gloves. Soon, the news got around to Jimmy Burke, and he went after Edwards. Hill grimaces as he looks toward the empty stool in the corner, where his friend Edwards often sat and played guitar. Just two days ago, Stax Edwards was shot and killed. Henry Hill still can't believe it. He lost a friend, but he also began to sense an ominous threat. He can tell that Burke is growing anxious and paranoid, and nothing is more dangerous than when Jimmy Burke feels like he's in a corner. Hill watches the aging mobster exhale another cloud of smoke. Burke then stubs out his cigarette and, with a cold, menacing look in his eyes, reaches down, grabs a telephone, and places it on the bar. He asks Hill to find the betting spread on the upcoming game between Boston College and UCLA. Hill breathes a sigh of relief. In recent days, his income had dried up because Burke put a stop on Hill's drug runs in order to avoid any scrutiny from the police. The scam at Boston College became Hill's only option to make a dollar, but Burke said he might shut it down too. Now, though, it appears the scheme is alive and kicking, and Hill's livelihood is back on track. But then Hill looks again at the empty stool where Stax Edwards used to sit. He feels a gnawing worry. It's become a dangerous game to partner with Jimmy Burke, and not just for people like Stax Edwards, who got sloppy and dug his own grave. Hill knows that when it comes to Boston College, he could face serious consequences even for small mistakes from Burke. So the scam has to go right. The next day, Rick Kuhn ducks his head and writes his new leather coat as he steps through the door of a DC-10 airplane in Boston's Logan Airport. Today, the Boston College team is bound for Los Angeles, where they'll take on the UCLA Bruins. Kuhn got the message loud and clear from his associates in the mob. Boston College needs to lose the game against UCLA, and they need to lose big. Kuhn walks down the airplane's aisle, finds his seat, and takes off his coat. This should be easy. No one expects the Eagles to keep the score close. The Bruins are legendary and have won eight of the last ten national titles. So Kuhn is already counting the money in his head. But right then, Kuhn hears something and looks up. The sound of Marvin Gaye coming from the front of the plane. Ernie Cobb strides down the aisle carrying a new boombox. Kuhn smiles, shakes his head. He knows Cobb doesn't have a dollar to his name. If he's buying toys, that can only mean one thing. He must have finally gotten in on the scam. Kuhn sits back with a satisfied grin. Now that Cobb is part of the plan, nothing can go wrong. But one thing still does bother Rick Kuhn, and that's Jim Sweeney. His friend Sweeney's been distant these past days, but there's reason to be optimistic. Sweeney did agree to sit next to Kuhn during the flight, and that should offer them a chance to make up, set things right. Kuhn watches as Sweeney walks down the aisle. He doesn't have any fancy luggage, just a modest backpack. Kuhn waves him over. But then Sweeney does something unexpected. He stows his backpack and sits down several rows up. At first, Kuhn is confused. He's positive that Sweeney saw him. The flight attendant announces that everyone should take their seats. Kuhn keeps his eyes trained on Sweeney, hoping he'll look back. Then he feels a hand tapping on his shoulder. He turns and finds another player, who asks if he can take the empty seat. Kuhn glances again at Sweeney, but his friend remains looking forward. Kuhn sighs. He lifts the new coat from the next seat and makes room for the teammate. Soon, the engines roar and the plane takes off. Kuhn stares out the window at the gray December sky. He'll just have to wait and talk with Sweeney when they land in California. It's the night of December 23rd, and Rick Kuhn can feel the electric energy that's rocketing through Pauley Pavilion just two minutes into the game against the UCLA Bruins. 
The band is blasting and tan college kids are shouting. And of course, the seats are full of NBA scouts who've come to find the next stars in pro basketball. One player on the Boston College Eagles has risen to the occasion. Ernie Cobb. He floats through the players, sinks another shot. Rick Kuhn cringes. Obviously, he was wrong. Cobb is not on board with the scheme. Instead, the Eagles star is playing his very hardest against UCLA. Kuhn bites his nails. If this doesn't turn around soon, the game could be a disaster. Kuhn promised the gamblers that the Eagles would dump the game, losing by more than the 15-point spread. But not only is Boston not losing by 15, there's the terrifying chance that they may actually win this thing. Kuhn knows the mob is betting big. If they lose, they'll want more than just answers. The game reaches halftime, and Rick Kuhn blanches as he reads the score. The Eagles are down by only two points. The team huddles together, and Kuhn tries to catch the eye of Jim Sweeney. He desperately wishes they could have talked alone before the game. Kuhn needs to know, is Sweeney in? Because if he's not, Kuhn has to let him know that the mobsters have lost their patience. They expect results, and they expect them tonight. Finally, Sweeney does look up, and Kuhn feels a flutter of hope. But that feeling quickly sinks. Sweeney's face is blank, unreadable. A moment later, the team splits apart and heads back to the court for the second half. Kuhn's not sure what's going to happen, and it's not looking good. But as the second half gets underway, Sweeney seems to be slowing the game down. He's walking the ball up the court, and he's no longer firing off passes to Ernie Cobb. And soon enough, UCLA starts to pull away. But Sweeney doesn't pick up the pace, and he doesn't pass the ball to Cobb. Finally, the buzzer sounds. Kuhn checks the scoreboard. UCLA 103, Boston College 81. Kuhn closes his eyes feels a huge surge of relief. The Eagles have lost, and they've lost big. And that means the mobsters won. It looks like Kuhn will live to see another day. And if this scam does have to keep going, there's a silver lining. Looks like Jim Sweeney is playing along. It's January 1979, a month after Boston College's defeat at UCLA. Barbara Reed stands in the doorway of her apartment, which she shares with her boyfriend, Rick Kuhn. Holding the door open, she sees Kuhn approaching with a group of friends. They're carrying several large boxes toward the apartment. Kuhn returned from the West Coast several weeks ago, and since then, Reed has watched the same scene unfold over and over. She's held the door for boxes of all kinds, a large color TV, queen-size brass bed, expensive clothes. There have been smaller boxes, too. One held a pair of jade earrings. They were a gift from Rick. He's also given her several necklaces and a ring made of black coral and gold inlaid with diamonds. When Reed saw that, she lost her breath. And yet she also feels tense with worry. Where was all this money coming from? Kuhn sets down the last of the boxes and thanks his friends. He closes the door behind them and grins at Reed and tells her to open a box. Reed searches through the packing peanuts and discovers something large and metallic, too heavy for her to lift. So Kuhn leans over and pulls it out proudly. It's a stereo receiver, a Pioneer SX-1280. Wow. Reed stares at the receiver. Her mouth hangs open. Rick, how much did this cost? You won't believe it. Only $1,500 for the whole system. What? That's more than a half a year's rent. Rick shrugs and starts opening the other boxes. It's top of the line. Turntable, tape deck, reel to reel. How can we afford the top of the line? I'm a nurse. My salary's not enough, and you don't even have a job. I told you, I'm making some side bets. Reed shakes her head, looks away. This isn't right. It doesn't add up. And they're not the only ones suddenly living like they're rich. Reed turns back to Kuhn. I saw Jim's girlfriend the other day. Mora's got a coral ring with diamonds exactly like mine. Oh, yeah? Well, I bought yours first. He's copying me. That's not the point, Rick. Is Jim gambling too? Babe, enough with the questions. Just listen to this. Check it out. Kuhn powers on the stereo and starts dancing to a disco song on the radio. Bass thumping. Reed crosses her arms. She wants answers. She wants them now. But then Kuhn shimmies up to her and shakes his hips. <laughs> she feels her concern slipping away. Kuhn spins and raises her hand in the air, and soon she can't help but smile. He reaches out, and Reed lets him pull her close. The two dance as music fills their apartment. But then, when she looks at Rick and sees his giant grin, her thoughts begin to spin again. She needs to know. 
What are these boys up to? And how long could it possibly last? It's February 3rd, 1979. Jim Sweeney sits on his bed, peering out into the living room. Right now, his roommates are welcoming in Rick Kuhn and another man, a guy who looks like a TV villain with a thick beard and a black coat and gloves. Sweeney's heard the stories from Kuhn, and he knows this has to be Rocco Perla. Sweeney feels lightheaded. Ever since he returned to Boston from the West Coast, he's barely been able to sleep or eat. And now it looks like things are about to get worse. Kuhn glances at Sweeney from the living room and steps aside from the group. He makes his way into Sweeney's bedroom. Kuhn closes the door and breaks out in giddy laughter. Tell Sweeney that he should receive a trophy for his work at UCLA. His performance was masterfully bad. He hopes Sweeney will provide an encore for the upcoming game against St. John's. Sweeney looks out the window at the falling snow. When this scam started, he knew it was a bad idea. But Kuhn gave him a lot of money, and he decided to buy some jewelry for his girlfriend, Mora. The look on her face made his anxieties melt away. But those good feelings didn't last. Sweeney wants out. Except he isn't sure how to make that happen. He could confess. He'd almost certainly be thrown off the team, and maybe thrown out of school. Sweeney has also been worrying about another threat. If he walked away from the scam, what would the Mafia do to him? Or his girlfriend? His family? Sweeney rubs his temples and tells Kuhn to sit down. He tells Kuhn that he wants out. Kuhn doesn't say a word. He just smiles and calmly explains that it's natural to be anxious, but no risk, no reward. Before Sweeney can respond, his bedroom door shoots open. Standing in the doorway is Rocco Perla, arms crossed. He asks if everything is good in here. Kuhn nods and says that Sweeney is just feeling a little scared. Perla laughs, then he squints his eyes and turns to Sweeney. He says that to be actually scared is to find your feet in cement as you're tipped off a boat in Boston Harbor. Is that the sort of scared Sweeney feels right now, sitting in his warm room with money to burn? Sweeney swallows, says no. He doesn't feel that scared. Kuhn slaps Sweeney on the knee, and he and Perla leave the bedroom. Sweeney looks down at his hands. They're shaking. Then he stands and quietly closes the door. It's February 6th, 1979, in New York City. Outside the St. John's Alumni Hall, the street is crowded with college kids. They're dressed in red and celebrating St. John's big win over Boston College. But inside the arena, Ernie Cobb sits alone on the bench. He stares at the scoreboard. St. John's 85, Boston College 76. Tonight, Cobb played the worst game of his life, and in the audience, there were NBA scouts from the New York Knicks and New Jersey Nets. Cobb saw them during warm-up with their clipboards and pencils. He knew they were tracking him. A great performance in this game would send his name to the top of their lists. But the game was a disaster. It turned out he wasn't competing with the other team. His opponents were Jim Sweeney and Rick Kuhn. Once again, they wouldn't pass him the ball, and this time Cobb lost his cool. He screamed at Sweeney and ended the night only making one out of seven shots from the floor. Cobb buries his face in his hands. He's ashamed, but also livid. And the teammate he sees now is the reason why. Across the gym, Rick Kuhn is headed to the exit. He looks glum, but Cobb knows it's not because the Eagles lost. It's because they didn't lose by enough. St. John's was favored by nine points, and they won by exactly nine. That means the gamblers didn't win any money on the game, but they didn't lose any either. It's Cobb's only consolation for a night gone so wrong. Cobb stands and surveys the empty basketball court. This is where he belongs, and this is where he can build a future for himself. Rick Kuhn and Jim Sweeney may have stopped him this game, but not next time. Two nights later, Rick Kuhn stands alone at his kitchen sink. He and his girlfriend, Barbara Reed, just had a huge fight. Now he's eating raisin bran for dinner and trying to calm himself down. Reed said she'd had it with Kuhn's evasiveness about money, and she added maybe she should ask Jim Sweeney about it. That's when Kuhn lost it. He warned her never to speak about the money to anybody, ever, or else. He didn't need to look at her eyes to know he'd gone too far, but the damage was done. When he did meet her gaze, she told him angrily that she was leaving. Kuhn stares numbly out the kitchen window. What happened to his life? His best friend stopped talking to him, and now his girlfriend is leaving. He may be winning bets, making money, but he's losing what actually matters. 
Just then, the phone rings. Who knows who it is? His old Pittsburgh acquaintance, Tony Perla, Rocco's brother, wanting to confirm that the gambler should bet on the upcoming game. This time, Boston is facing off against the Holy Cross Crusaders. Holy Cross is favored, but still, it's a hard game for Kuhn to guarantee. Holy Cross is a rival school, and anything can happen at a rivalry game. Still, Kuhn knows the gamblers won't accept that kind of talk. Kuhn picks up the phone and hears the familiar raspy voice on the line. As he guessed, it's Tony Perla. Perla doesn't ask Kuhn anything. He only says that their New York friends are betting and betting big. They expect payouts, Jimmy Burke in particular. Kuhn begins to protest, but Perla cuts him short. He warns Kuhn to dump the Holy Cross game. No ifs, ands, or buts. Boston College needs to lose by at least seven points. If they don't, there will be problems. And, Perla says, you don't want to create problems for Jimmy Burke right now. Not when all his solutions require body bags. Kuhn hangs up, his heart pounding. He looks at his cereal and dumps the bowl down the drain. He's lost his appetite. It's February 10th, 1979 in Queens, New York City. Henry Hill rubs his hands together, trying to warm them up, and looks to his side where his friend Jimmy Burke is standing. Hill gives Burke a pat on the shoulder. The two stepped outside to check on Burke's home renovations. In a couple of minutes, they'll head back in and keep watching the game between Boston College and Holy Cross. Hill's in a good mood tonight. Burke seems calm and at ease. Maybe he's finally letting go of his paranoia. It gripped him the moment the police found the getaway van, and it's turned lethal. But Hill knows that the Lufthansa investigation is probably a dead end. The police found the masks and gloves from the robbery, but the only prints in the van belonged to Stax Edwards, and he's certainly not talking. But still, Burke had been ruthless. One of Burke's associates, the man who brought the Lufthansa deal, has vanished. Another was found dead inside a meat freezer. But tonight, Burke is all smiles as he looks over the new brickwork on his house. Maybe the tides have changed, Hill thinks. Maybe the killings are over. The two head back inside the house and grab a seat in front of the TV again. The announcer has just said that coming into the second half, Holy Cross is at 82. Boston College Eagles are trailing by 10 points at 72. Burke cracks a smile and takes a sip of whiskey. Beautiful. Keep that express elevator going down, boys. Hill watches as the Eagles race up the court. The two teams get caught in a tangle of elbows. A Holy Cross player goes down, and Jim Sweeney fouls out of the game. It's good news for their bet, though. The Eagles have to lose by at least seven points. And with Sweeney out, the score's not likely to get any higher. He grins and raises a glass. Maybe we do open up that second bottle, Jimmy. Oh, I got it right here. Hand me your glass. But before Burke can pour, he sees a streak of movement on the screen. Ernie Cobb steals an inbound pass and races down the court. He then lays the ball up into the basket. On another play, soon after, Cobb fakes a pass, then lifts it into the air and arcs a shot. The ball swishes in, all net. Hill stares at the screen. He can't believe what he's seeing. What the hell is that? And just as quickly, Cobb does it again. Burke turns to Hill with a glint of fire in his eyes. Henry, what's happening here? Why is that young man losing his mind? I don't know. Where is he? Where's Kuhn? Kuhn's got to stop him. Hill watches as Kuhn tries to get in Cobb's way, but Cobb just spins right past him and scores again. The Eagles are now within four points. Okay, okay. It's The game's not over. Kuhn and Sweeney stopped him last time, so... Oh, really, Sweeney, the guy sitting on the bench... Burke rips his chair's armrest, grits his teeth. It's unbelievable. The way Cobb is playing, he could win it all by himself. Hill feels a panic rising inside him. He wants to somehow stop this, turn this game around, but sitting here in Jimmy Burke's house, in front of Jimmy Burke's TV, he feels completely helpless. The final whistle blows. Ernie Cobb almost won the game, but Holy Cross barely held on to victory, 98 to 96. But that's not good news for Hill and Burke. Hill shuts his eyes and breathes, hoping for something to change. But when he reopens them, the final score is still there. Boston College lost by two, and they needed to lose by at least seven. Burke gets up, turns off the television. He stands there, calmly nodding. Then suddenly he raises his leg and kicks in the TV with a roar. 
Shattered glass rains down on the carpet as the TV set falls off its base. Henry, I just lost $60,000. 60,000. Okay, Jimmy. Okay. What do they even teach at that college? Because it sure ain't common sense. Bert gulps his drink, slams his glass down. But I think I can teach them a lesson. And here it is. The lesson is that nobody loses my money and walks away. Nobody. You understand? He'll open his mouth to protest, but before he can, Burks looks at him and snarls. Call up Tony Perlin. Tell him I want those three kids, Coon, Sweeney, and Cobb. Make them go away. Cold draft comes through the window. Those dumb kids, Hill thinks. All they had to do was play by the rules and follow Jimmy Burke's orders. Now it's too late. Hill knows that tonight was probably the last time they'll step on a basketball court. Maybe the last time they'll walk on this earth. It's mid-morning on May 21st, 1979. Three months have passed since Boston College was narrowly defeated by Holy Cross. The basketball season has since ended, and on this warm spring day, sunlight falls on a mass of eager, black-robed students. Today, they're gathered outside Boston College's Alumni Stadium. Their square caps and tassels bounce as they file inside for graduation. Rick Kuhn walks in the middle of the crowd, towering over his classmates and sweating under his cap and gown. Can't believe he's actually here. Kuhn feared the worst after that disastrous Holy Cross game. That same night, Henry Hill called him personally. Kuhn's hands get clammy just remembering Hill's describing what exactly a group of high-level gangsters wanted to do to him and the other Boston boys. That night, Kuhn tried to explain himself. He told Hill that his hands were tied after Jim Sweeney intentionally fouled out, that he couldn't stop Cobb all by himself. Kuhn begged Hill to let him somehow make amends with the mob. But Hill cut him off and said that he had some good news. He told Kuhn that he was one lucky brat. His associates had enough headaches right now. They didn't need a bunch of dead college kids to add to the mess. So the basketball fix was over. In fact, Hill said it never happened. Forget all about it and just make yourself scarce. With that, Hill hung up the phone. Kuhn stood there, gripping the phone's receiver, stunned in disbelief and joy. Now, as Kuhn makes his way toward graduation, he smiles. He's making himself scarce, all right. This summer, he's headed to South America. His plan is to play basketball and have a few adventures. The timing isn't ideal. Barbara Reed is back in his life, and she wants them to settle down. But what can a man do if the mob tells you to get out of town? Kuhn makes his way up the aisle and spots Jim Sweeney in the crowd. Sweeney is a junior, and so today he's only wearing khakis and a white shirt. But there he is, America's golden boy, ready to support the graduates. Kuhn once had a friend in Sweeney, but since the season ended... Sweeney has completely avoided him. Kuhn heard that Sweeney plans to marry his girlfriend Mara after graduation. Kuhn chuckles to himself. He's sure that Mara didn't mind all the jewelry that Sweeney bought her, courtesy, of course, illegal gambling. Kuhn decides to approach Sweeney. And when he nears his old friend, Sweeney finally looks over at him. There's a long pause, and then Sweeney offers his congratulations. Kuhn nods. He asks how Sweeney will get on next year without him, without all the excitement. Sweeney gives a wry smile. He tells Kuhn that he'll get on just fine. He's looking forward to feeling a little more bored. And with that, Jim Sweeney turns and walks away. Kuhn feels a familiar, bittersweet sadness as Sweeney leaves. But what's done is done. Kuhn can accept the decisions he's made. Kuhn takes a seat. He looks out over the crowd at all the bright-faced young graduates, all of them excited to embark on good and prosperous lives. He shakes his head. If only they knew what he'd been through. But that chapter of his life is over. And he realizes he's ready for the next one, that he too is ready to live a good and prosperous life. It's April 27, 1980, about a year later. Henry Hill is high on cocaine and driving way too fast as he heads home to Nassau County, New York. But Hill feels great, and it's not just the coke. He's flush with cash from his drug running enterprise, and finally he feels in control of his life. He pulls up behind an old van that's idling at a stop sign. It looks familiar. Looks just like the one that Stax Edwards was supposed to have crushed after the Lufthansa heist. It was the van that got him killed. Hill shakes his head. This time last year, Jimmy Burke was still in a murderous rage. He even wanted those college kids dead. Thankfully, Hill convinced him otherwise. 
He told Burke that killing mobsters is one thing, but if you start whacking college boys, folks will hunt you down. Burke grudgingly agreed, and he just walked away. Hill's Boston College headache had mercifully ended. Hill leans on the horn, but for some reason the van's not moving. He can't even get around because there's another car alongside him. He throws his Lincoln into reverse and turns to check his side mirror. But instead of a mirror, Hill is looking straight down the barrel of a 357 Magnum revolver. The police officer on the opposite side of the weapon tells Hill to raise his hands, slowly. Hill is ordered to exit the car and march to an awaiting squad cruiser. It's there he learns he's being arrested on narcotics charges. Hill's mind whips through the math. A drug charge for someone with his record can bring 25 years, and he's positive there will be multiple charges. Not to mention, he still faces five years parole on his old extortion conviction. Hill feels the blood rush from his face. He's going away forever. But then he thinks about Jimmy Burke, and his whole body goes cold. How will Burke react to his arrest? Hill's been working for Burke since he was 13. He knows the mobster's crimes, and he knows where all the bodies are buried, and that's no metaphor. If Burke thinks Hill might talk, doesn't need to worry about jail time. He's already a dead man. Less than a week later, in Brooklyn, New York, two U.S. Marshals lead Henry Hill down a long hallway. Hill is shackled in chains, and the group is walking through a federal courthouse toward the offices of the U.S. Department of Justice. The Marshals bring Hill to a small room, where a large mahogany desk is covered with manila files and legal papers. Behind the desk sits a 30-year-old man with dark hair and a conservative gray suit. The man nods, and the marshals unshackle Hill and guide him into a chair. He looks around at the stacks of papers, then locks eyes with the man. So, you the big kahuna? I'm Ed McDonald, Mr. Hill, chief prosecutor of the Lufthansa investigation. I understand you may have some facts related to the case. Hill nods and looks away. From the moment he was arrested, his imagination ran wild with terror. Every shadow was a threat, every inmate a possible assassin ordered by Jimmy Burke. Finally, Hill realized there was only one way to survive. He had to play ball with the authorities and share what he knew about the Lufthansa heist. Becoming a rat was terrible, but it sure beat dying. Hill turns back to the prosecutor. Sure, Ed. I know where a few bodies are buried. Okay, I'm listening. Any bodies I might know? Well, let's see. Stax Edwards, Marty Krugman, Richie Eaton in the freezer truck, Tommy Montaloni. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty much your ticket to ride. And what's the price of this ticket, Mr. Hill? Well, Ed, I'm thinking complete immunity for my charges, plus witness protection for me, my wife, and my kids. Otherwise, Jimmy Burke will have me whacked before I can even think about helping you. McDonald takes a sip of his coffee and shoots Hill a cold look. Usually, Mr. Hill, I'd be very interested in your assistance. The problem is it's not just your word against Mr. Burke's. Everyone else, as you appear to know, is dead. Yeah, they're dead because of Jimmy Burke. (sighs) Well, all right, let's at least get your story, and then we can talk about what's fair. Where were you the day of the Lufthansa robbery? I was in Boston. I remember hearing about it on the radio. Okay, and what were you doing there in Boston? I was there for this, uh, this side deal, fixing basketball games. Actually, Jimmy was a part of that, too. McDonald leaned forward in his seat. Hill can see a hint of rage in the prosecutor's eyes. You were fixing basketball games in Boston. Where exactly? Boston College. I was paying some brats there to shave points. God, it was a real headache. Anyway, I heard about Lufthansa on the radio, and I knew it was Jimmy. McDonald hurls his coffee mug across the room. It smashes against a far wall, and Hill looks back in disbelief at McDonald, who's breathing heavily. Okay. Well, I I can see you're upset, but but I haven't really told you the bad parts yet. Did you know, scumbag, that I went to Boston College? That I played basketball at Boston College? And now you're telling me you fixed the games there? Well, that's a strange coincidence. You said that James Burke took part in this Boston College scheme? Oh, yeah, yeah. We used Jimmy's bookies. He threw a ton of money at it. Even wanted the kids dead after they cost him 60 grand on a game. But I talked him out of it. Hill is surprised to see a slight smile spread across the prosecutor's face. Well, Mr. Hill, I think we might be able to work out a deal after all. Immunity, protection, all of it. That is, if you're interested in telling me more about Boston College. 
Henry Hill leans back in his chair. The prosecutor waits for a response. Hill feels a wave of relief. He smiles. This is his ticket to freedom. Now all he has to do is talk. Next on American Scandal, the FBI begins investigating the ties between Boston College basketball players and Jimmy Burke's crime ring. As the point-shaving trial gets underway, the athletes discover there's a larger game being played, and they're the pawns. From Wondery, this is episode two of the Boston College Gambling Scheme for American Scandal. And a quick note about our reenactments. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but those scenes are dramatizations based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about the Boston College Gambling Scheme, we recommend Fixed by David Porter and The Lufthansa Heist by Daniel Simone. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Barrett. This episode is written by Charles Olivier, edited by Christina Malsberg, produced by Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wonder.